Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Council of Trent podcast. I'm your host, Catholic Answers apologist and speaker, Trent Horn. I'm very excited for today's interview. Uh, the guest that we're having on, I think he's done a lot of great work when it comes to the philosophy of religion. And even though we come to dramatically different conclusions when it comes to the philosophy of religion, we have a lot in common when it comes to how we should engage this subject matter. So I'm very excited to introduce him. Our guest today is Mr. Joe Schmidt. He is a undergrad in philosophy at Purdue University. He also has his own YouTube channel, Majesty of Reason, uh, where he takes a, I would say, a higher level approach to engaging arguments for and against the existence of God. And today we're going to talk about the agnostic case against atheism. What do we mean by that? Joe will help us learn a bit more about that. But Joe, welcome to the Council of Trent podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm I'm really excited for this. And yeah, I, I definitely see a kind of unity in our approach, which is, it's wonderful. Yeah, so if anyone's seen the, the previous channel, uh, Joe has offered some reflections on my previous statements that I've given in my debates with Alex O'Connor and Ben Watkins. I've offered some replies to Joe. He has replies to me. The replies are currently being stored up in a kind of Hilbert's hotel of <laughs> replies and back and forth. Hopefully, Joe and I will be able to engage each other. I'm not sure the forum. Uh, it might be debate, dialogue, it could be YouTube, maybe even a a written length treatment, because I think uh, Joe and I go deeper into some of these issues than other people tread, and writing might be helpful for that, but also dialoguing about it. And I like that we can dialogue about it, because you take, unlike many people who are non-theistic, to describe them, so you are a non-theist, you do not believe that God exists, but you don't use many of the same terminology or even Uh, beliefs as many other non-theists, like identifying themselves as atheists or people who are very confident God does not exist, things like that. How would you describe yourself? I've seen you describe yourself more as an agnostic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I I have this uh, term that I use, I call myself an epistemic agnostic, and there are different kinds of agnostic, but I guess we should probably um, just start with agnostic, what that is. Right. So, um, whenever we have some proposition or statement, we can take a bunch of different attitudes towards it. So let's just consider the proposition, what, uh, extraterrestrial life exists. Sure. Okay. So one attitude you can take to that is believe that it's false. Okay. You can affirm the negation of that proposition. You could say that inaccurately describes reality. Reality is not like that. So that's a kind of positive claim. You're saying it's not like that. Reality is not like that. So that's believing that it's false. You can also believe that it's true. So you can affirm the proposition. You take it to accurately represent reality. Mm -hmm. But a third main attitude that you can have is to just suspend or withhold belief or judgment about it. You neither believe it's true, nor you believe it's false. And in that case, you would be agnostic toward the proposition. Now, there are a bunch of other attitudes that you can take, but those are like the three main ones. Belief, right. disbelief, which is belief in the negation, and then finally, suspension of judgment, which is agnosticism. So that's just the general term, agnostic. But of course, what we're interested in here is applying it to the context of God's existence. Right. So the relevant proposition here would be God exists. And by God, we could just use a kind of generic term for um, the ultimate foundation that created everything else that necessarily exists and that's perfect, something like that. Mm-hmm. That's a kind of pretty neutral definition of God. And so with that definition out of the way, an agnostic in this context would mm-hmm. just be someone who withholds judgment on that proposition. They don't believe it to be true, but they also do not believe it to be false. Mm-hmm. And so um, now we're getting to the kind of more specific kinds of agnostics. So right. I, this is my own terminology. Uh, I think it's helpful. Because so well, I, before, before you continue, uh, to me, there could be two types of agnostics. One who would say, personally, they don't know whether God exists or not, a personal agnostic. And the other might be a global agnostic who would say, I don't know if God exists and nobody else knows if he exists or doesn't exist either. So one's making a broader claim, one's making Mm -hmm. a narrower Narrower. claim. So how how would your view slide into that? Yeah, so mine would probably fit into the more personal one. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, because I think that we all have access to different evidence bases. We all have different testimonial evidence. We all Mm -hmm. have different books that we've read, papers that we've read, um, classes that we've attended, and and, uh, experiences that we've had just living in the world, being in the world. We all have our own kind of evidence base. And sure, a lot of that is intersubjectively available. But 
other aspects of it are, are private um, that, that you only yourself have experienced. So I would go that more personal room, your distinction. And that's actually similar to the distinction that I was going to make. So the distinction that I was going to make is between an in principle agnostic and an epistemic agnostic. So an in principle agnostic is kind of similar to your global uh, agnostic. Mm -hmm. An in principle agnostic says it's impossible in principle to know or have justified beliefs about whether or not God exists. Like, I don't know. You don't know because no one can know. That, that's that, what the What's funny is, is that oh, that's kind of like what Michael Shermer says. Michael Shermer is the former editor of Skeptic Magazine. And he has this little famous line. He says, I don't know if God exists and you don't either. Yeah. It's his little, his little slogan. So that might be the global or the not in principle. What's the other word that you, or the in principle. Is that the yeah. word you used? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, exactly. He, he, that sounds like a, <laughs> exact, that's like exactly what I was spelling out. So that's a right. good example. And then on the other hand, uh, we can have an epistemic agnostic, which is what I call myself. Um, and they just hold that um, while it might be possible in principle to know or have justified beliefs of one way or the other, um, the weight of the reasons on either side, roughly counterbalance one another for, for themselves. They think that in their, their research, uh, the weight of the evidence roughly counterbalances one another. So that's kind of, um, I guess that's what I mean. And, and No, I think that that's really helpful because a lot of atheists define themselves uh, in a way that I think is a very poor sort of definition. You've been interviewed about this before, something we might call lactheism. Uh, they define atheism as just the lack of belief in the existence of God, which is a description of a psychological state, not a description about the way the world is. So it's similar, what you said about aliens, that's kind of an example I've also used with atheists when I've engaged them. But sometimes for me, when I'm engaging, when I'm engaging an atheist, I would say, well, I would be really happy if you just went from God's, the probability of God's existence is like 0.1%. If I could get that to like 50%, I would be having a, a real great day to even get you um, that far because sometimes they'll, they'll say this, well, I'm an atheist because there's no evidence for God. And I would say, well, that's an odd position to make. That'd be like me saying, I believe there are no extraterrestrial beings in the universe because there is no evidence for them. And that may be the case. There is no evidence for them, but it doesn't follow that I could then make the next claim. ET is not out there somewhere yeah. by Alpha Centauri or somewhere else. At most, it would just get me to the to the agnostic position. Yeah. So do you sometimes get frustrated by atheists? Because, oh, the question about belief, disbelief, and withholding. Because sometimes I ask people, look, the atheism, theism, I'll make it to you this way. The, the, the question, does God exist? You could either say yes, no, or I don't know. And so I don't know. What, yes is theism. No is atheism. I don't know is agnosticism. But then it gets hopelessly confusing when you have people saying they're agnostic atheists. Yeah. And I just have a hard time following that. Yeah, as do I. I mean, at least in philosophy, um, agnosticism is the suspension of judgment concerning God's existence. And so right. an agnostic is someone who neither believes nor disbelieves in God. And by contrast, an atheist is someone who believes that, that God doesn't exist. That's at least in philosophy. Now, don't get me wrong, right? I mean, people, their words, right? People can define terms. How, but I do think that, that some ways of defining things are at least better than others. Uh, and so what really matters is that whenever you're talking with someone individually, what really matters is getting clear on the concept. So if they're going to, you know, stick to their guns um, with lack theism, um, it's better just to move on to the issues and, you know, talk about the evidence and right. so on. And, and but um, if we're going to, yeah, go on. Well, what I would say is then, unlike many people who are kind of products of the new atheists, people like Dawkins, Harris, Dennett, the, the, you know, uh, these individuals from the early 2000s, when we call them new atheists, I don't think we mean, it's not really, they don't really have new arguments. Many of the arguments are kind of old hat. It, what was new was sort of their attitude of saying, well, previously in the 20th century, atheists would critique religion, but still give it a kind of deference. We'd be gentlemen about it, like Bertrand Russell and Frederick, Father Frederick Copleston and their little, little chat about the existence of God. And the new atheists are saying, no, we shouldn't even give religion respect. Religion, you know, science flies people to the moon. Religion flies airplanes into buildings. 9-11 being one of the precursors of the new atheism. So we, we, it, not only are religious people wrong, but they're irrationally wrong. Like they're, they are, to quote Dawkins, they're deluded. That not only are they wrong, because you could be mistaken about something. Like if I think that it's 545, and right now that's actually 538. I'm mistaken. If I thought it was three, three in the morning, I would be deluded because I see sunshine coming in. It's, it's completely 
contradicted by other evidence. Uh, and so I think that the position you would take on the existence of God is not that believers are deluded, but rather you as an agnostic, you could say a person could be a rational atheist and they could be a rational theist. Yeah, absolutely. And what's so ironic about the whole, oh, religion is delusional, oh, belief in God is irrational. What's so ironic about that is that then they'll go on to be like, oh no, I just lack a belief in God, by the way. Uh, right. But, uh, but believing in God is irrational and delusional. And uh, yeah, it's like, come on. Like you guys are obviously being inconsistent. You're treating um, God's existence as, as like fairies and Santa Claus and these things that we obviously believe don't exist, that we ludicrous to believe in. And your, your attitude certainly reveals that you think that uh, it's ludicrous to believe in it. But when pressed, oh no, I just lack a belief. I'm not making any claims. We uh, uh, so there's certainly an inconsistency there. Uh, yeah. Let's let's jump into um, so we've got some terms down here. So agnosticism, atheism. So you hold that a person could rationally believe God exists. They could also also rationally believe God does not exist. You're not convinced of either of those propositions. Uh, I've engaged a lot of your work so far on why you're not convinced of theism. So I thought it'd be fun for you and I to sit down something we agree on. I'm not rationally convinced of atheism, and neither are you. So maybe we could talk about some of those arguments and why they don't convince you. And they might not convince us for different reasons, though. Mm -hmm. uh, so and let's, I mean, what, what, yeah, go ahead. One thing we can distinguish between is like, um, there's an agnostic who thinks, this is a different kind of dichotomy. There might be an agnostic who doesn't see any reasons on either side versus an agnostic who sees reasons oh, yes. on both sides and sees that there, there are significant considerations counting in favor of either. Uh, and I would fall in that latter camp. I do think that there are significant considerations that count in, in favor of um, naturalism, say, a version of, of atheism, and theism, on the other hand. I think that there are considerations that, that um, weigh quite significantly on so, each side. So you think, so you don't agree with atheists when they say there's no evidence for God? Yeah. Or, and, <laughs> I was just going to say, yeah, we're going to see later on that, that I, I did definitely disagree. And I, and I think what's... Yeah, um, um, but, but yeah, go on. Uh, what's uh, hard with that is um, sometimes some atheists have become a bit more shrewd about that. So they'll say, oh, I'm saying there's no good evidence for God. And then I want to say, well, what do you mean by good evidence? I think sometimes some people in this debate, and especially about the existence of God, think some evidence is that which indisputably proves that something is true. And I would say, you've got a very high view of evidence, my friend. Yeah. My understanding was that evidence is just something that makes a proposition more likely true than false. And so this, there's this idea, they think, oh, well, if there were good evidence for X, God's existence, whatever, then everybody would believe it. But that's silly, because there's many things people disagree about. And we acknowledge there's good evidence on either side, even among atheists, like atheists disagree. Here's an example. So Sam Harris and Daniel Dennett disagree about whether free will and determinism are compatible. So could you have free will if the world is determined? Dennett says yes. Harris says no. They disagree. And there's good evidence for both of their views. But it doesn't, it, you know, it doesn't mean they're both equally right. It's just hard for me when people, do you see that they have that truncated view of what evidence is? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, some, this is just goes back to asking people like, what, what precisely do you mean by evidence? Or if they change it to good evidence, what do you mean by that? I mean, I've often found, um, and again, this is just engaging with more kind of new atheist types, but, uh, and, uh, you know, everyone's different. We don't want to try to categorize people automatically from the get-go, but people that generally fall into this kind of new atheist side, uh, they tend to say like, well, when I ask, what do you mean by evidence? And then they're, they're getting into something like, oh, empirical evidence or, you know, something like, or like scientific evidence. I'm like, come on. <laughs> so yeah, then it gets into like scientism and then, you know. Right. But uh, yeah. And then just a dismissal of other questions. Because what I try to get people to see is, all right, well, the existence of God, it's not a scientific question. I feel like I have to start at the basement and say, are there non-scientific questions that are worth us discussing? Yeah. And I feel like a lot of them will say, no, it reminds me in um, uh, Melodino and Hawking's book, The Grand Design. Uh, so the late physicist Stephen Hawking and his co-author Leonard Melodino, they wrote a book, uh, Grand Design, 
And I think at the beginning of the book, it says something. I remember it being really, I don't know if you, if you read it or not. It, it was very arrogant saying that scientists are the torchbearers of investigation. It's like they're riding the train and the philosopher is just running alongside waving the papers. And I thought that was such a snooty, arrogant way to talk <laughs> about an important field. Yeah, I, I, I think, who was it? Um, was it Hawking who said that philosophy is dead or something like Someone said that. I think, he, like, said, I think he might've said that in Grand Design. Even. I think that's where it's quoted from. And I'm like, Bada bing, give me some argument for that. You're doing philosophy. Okay. So. Yeah. All right. Well, let's, let's talk at some of the arguments then for atheism. Uh, first one would be just a presumption of atheism. Uh, so you have the, the lazy lack theism, but then you have people like Antony Flew who say, well, we should just start with the presumption of atheism. And if the theist can't make his case, atheism kind of wins by default. Uh, your thoughts? Yeah. So I guess the notion of presume here is something like, if I presume something is or is not the case, well, then we're saying that a particular proposition, the thing that we're presuming, that's to be believed unless and until like, sufficiently strong considerations to the contrary are or come to light. So that's probably, I mean, that's the key notion of presumption here. And I guess I don't quite buy, <laughs> I don't see any reason to think that, that atheism is the position that should be believed positively uh, unless and until some positive considerations are adduced against it. I mean, it seems to me that making claims about the way the world is, is what bears the justification, is what bears a burden of justification. And since both atheism and the theism make claims the world is, both of them are saying, hey, I know, that, I know that reality is such and such a way, or I have a justified belief about the way reality is. There isn't such a thing as this perfect foundation, or there is such a thing as this perfect foundation. You're making a claim about the way that reality is, and so you need to bear a burden of justification for that, to think that. And so there's no presumption of atheism over theism here because both of them precisely have this, this onus of justification. And I mean, I think they're going to try to push back on this. They're going to try to say like, oh, well, well, one way they might say like, oh, no, atheism isn't making a positive claim about the way the world is. <laughs> that would be the lack theism route. But we've already seen that that's... Well, that, that, well, that's lack not taken too seriously. Right, but but lack theism, so. yeah, the problem with lack theism is just if all you're saying the statement is, I lack a belief in God, my follow up question is, why do you lack a belief in God? Why yeah. should I take your lack of belief in God seriously? My one year old lacks a belief in God, but he lacks a belief in many, many things that are true. So the mere fact that you lack a belief in something, who cares? Sometimes yeah. <laughs> I get so fed up with this. I say, your lack of belief in God is just not very interesting to me. I want to figure out how the world works. Yeah. And do you have any view of that that is helpful to me? Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I mean, like, I guess we can imagine someone just who like pronounces, there is no God. And then, now imagine that we had someone that comes up and asks, like, well, hey, what, what, you made that claim. Why do you think that? And then they're like, oh, uh, the burden isn't on me to justify that claim. Uh, the burden is on you to prove that I'm, that I'm wrong. It's and like, this is where what? the agnostic, Joe, this is why I'd like to keep you around in my pocket on Twitter <laughs> because I have people, well, I have people who will say, uh, you know, there's, there's no good evidence for God, which is another claim that's sort of related to that. And I would, and I would say, um, all right, well, why should I believe that? Then the reply is, well, give me some good evidence. As if, you know, okay, yeah. but imagine I had my agnostic friend here. And let's say he's not like you. He's not well-read. He's agnostic because he just found out about God five minutes ago. Mm -hmm. He just found out about the debate. And he's saying, ah, oh, this God character of yours. You say there's no good evidence. I've not, I just found out about this whole thing. Why should I believe that? What are you going to tell him is yeah. kind of the, the reply that I give. I mean, yeah, the other thing I worry about the presumption of atheism argument is that I think a lot of atheists who make it think that there's nothing wrong. They're so worried about falsely believing things do exist. They're not worried about falsely believing the non-existence of things. Let me see if I can get yeah. my, my head around that. that. They would rather, they would say, well, we, we should start with the presumption a thing does not exist until we have proof for it. Now that will keep you, that, that's a good way to keep you from falsely believing in things, like believing in things that don't exist. But then you have a lot of other harms <laughs> that you'll still, you will still end up having like untold numbers of false beliefs if you start with the presumption a thing does not exist until there's evidence for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah does, does, I mean, does that follow with you? Yeah, exactly. And that, that kind of gets me to what I, what, I, what I tend to think is like, I guess the presumption is just 
not making some claim about the way the world is. I mean, that, that's, that's where you kind right. of start off with. It, it, would, it would be like if I said with you, oh, there's no dog in your room because uh, there is no dog in your room because I haven't seen evidence for it. Well, he could be asleep right in front of you. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and exactly. I, I'm, I'm not justified in making that presumption just solely in lack of evidence. So I think we see that's a weaker one. Let's, let's kick it up Well, a I could notch. probably try to bolster their... Uh, yeah, let me see if I can try to All bolster All right, their, steel man away. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to steal man it. So they might turn to something like Russell's teapot, right? Or, or something like that, or maybe the flying spaghetti monster. And so they'll say like, hey, the idea is that Firstly, there's a presumption against believing in Russell's teapot that's in orbit between Earth and Mars. Right. Just spot. Uh, and there's also a presumption against believing the flying spaghetti monster. And secondly, God is relevantly similar to such entities. And so there's a presumption against God. Now, uh, I think the response that I would make to that is that, mm -hmm. um, like, what is that relevant similarity, right? I mean, that's it, the key. Is, is, it, is, it that they're, is it that God's existence is prima facie implausible or is it that it's intrinsically improbable. Uh, however you cash it out, we need some positive reason for thinking that God is relevantly similar to such entities. And then once one is doing that, you're just engaging in the project of giving reasons favoring atheism over theism, which defeats the whole purpose of the presumption of atheism argument. The whole right. purpose is that it's the theist, not the atheist, that needs to give positive reasons for their view. But in order to establish this very claim, right, the proponent mm -hmm. of the presumption of atheism thesis, um, as we've just seen, has to make positive arguments or positive reasons favoring atheism over theism, either from considerations of intrinsic probability or consideration of prima facie implausibility or, and so on. Yeah, so like the, the Russell's teapot example is, well, we just kind of know there is no teapot between Earth and Mars, and it's just the lack of evidence fueling that claim. But you're right. We, have an in, we, ha, we already know something about teapots, that they, mm. they don't have a nature towards doing that that makes it implausible, to which sometimes my reply to that is, let's change the example. Is there an interstellar probe orbiting between Earth and Mars that keeps an eye on Earth, and the Earth is essentially a wildlife refuge for extraterrestrials. That's one of the hypotheses uh, about what, if the universe is so vast, why haven't we encountered extraterrestrial life? And I, I believe that relates to the, Fermi, the Fermi, Fermi paradox. Uh, you know, well, where are they? And one of the replies is they're purposely ignoring us because we're this backwater species like the prime directive in Star Trek don't disturb these crude primitive creatures. So is there a probe around between Earth and Mars keeping an eye on us? I don't know, but it, you see, it's not it's like not the like teapot. I would just start with just pure agnosticism. So I think you're right that when you have to start with, is the thing we're speculating about, what's its intrinsic probability? If you say God is like fairies or Santa Claus, you got to offer a little, little bit more than just, than just the assertion. Um, exactly. Let's go to the next one. So someone might do that. They might say, well, God does not exist because God is logically impossible or God is a logical contradiction. This is often called the incompatible properties argument, saying, um, and there's two kinds. The next two arguments, well, really, I think any of the arguments for God not existing deal with some kind of incompatibility. You could either say things within God are incompatible where there's an incompatibility between God and what we perceive in the world, which seem to be the stronger ones. But we'll start with just the things in God are incompatible, so God does not exist. Right off the bat, one of the problems with this, and this will be interesting chapter between the two of us, is you might say, it will depend on what you mean by God to see if the properties of what you're defining really are incompatible. So you can tell us a little more of your thought on these arguments. Yeah, so like incompatible properties arguments are meant to be these kinds of like, a priori, like from the armchair, like deductive demonstrations that God is impossible because they're trying to tease out some kind of internal contradiction or incompatibility. He's like there. a married so, bachelor. Yeah, yeah, and exactly. And so there are at least two kinds of these incompatibility property arguments. Like, so one of them, you just focus on one property and you say that that alone is just not a possible property. So maybe omniscience or maybe omnipotence. Uh, and then the second kind would be, uh, there are two or more properties of God such that taken together, they're incompatible or uh, impossible. Or right, so for the like first that. example might be, if, if God is omnipotent, if God is omnipotent or all powerful, and it's essential, he has to be omnipotent to be God. Mm -hmm. And then you ask, well, can God make a rock so big he can't lift it? If he can lift the rock, he can't make the rock. And if he can't lift it, that's something he can't do. Ergo, he's not omnipotent, so he can't exist. That would be a single property argument. Mm -hmm. uh, but it seems like a lot of these arguments, all you have to do is just provide a more, and similar with the, 
the multiple property arguments would be like, well, if God is, if God is all powerful, he can do anything. But if he's all knowing, he knows everything. So can he change his mind? Either he can't or he doesn't know everything. But it seems like either single or multiple property arguments, all you have to do to get around them is just provide a more coherent description of the properties. Usually, yeah. Usually that's the best way to do it. Um, like for omnipotence, right? Uh, it is a little bit difficult to spell out uh, what precisely omnipotence is. I mean, two options you might take that avoid the stone paradox would be um, God is omnipotent uh, just in case. Um, God, ha- God can do absolutely anything that doesn't detract from uh, perfection or that doesn't limit him, doesn't entail any limitation on his end. Mm-hmm. So for instance, creating a world that doesn't entail any limitation on God's end, uh, creating a, a multiverse that doesn't entail any, you know, freeing the Israelites and so on, like all these different sorts of things that um, we want to say that an omnipotent being can do, this definition allows us to, to get that. Um, but also it allows you to say, uh, it give a principled reason why God, for instance, can't sin because that would entail some kind of limitation on God's part. Right. Sinning is irrational or doing something morally wrong. That's contrary to reason, contrary to goodness. And so, um, uh, God can't do that because that would entail some limitation on his end. He also can't like digest food. Uh, you know, that's not a power that God can have. He can't digest food because he doesn't have a physical digestive system. And, but because having that would entail some kind of limitation, he'd be added to a particular spatial location and, uh, uh, and so on. So like, I think that, that kind of analysis gives some, some good results. So that, mm-hmm. I mean, that's one way to do it. Well, I, there, and there's others too. Uh, yeah, you, can, absolutely. You, you can just try to shrink the notion of omnipotence. I like, um, I think it's Thomas Flint and Alfred Ferdoso have an, an essay on this with one of the most BA uh, titles for a philosophy essay, which is on omnipotence. It's called Maximal Power. And just like, we should <laughs> yes. make a movie about this, which is the idea that <laughs> omnipotence just means God has the most power of any being. You know, yeah. if power means you can just do things, well, God is just the being that can do more than any being without trying to stipulate all the things he can or can't do. I, I would just hold to some kind of um, logically or at least metaphysically possible. Like, I don't think God can do logical impossibilities or metaphysical yeah. impossibilities. Like, I don't think God, and this is for a lot of people, people will say, well, what are you talking about? What's the difference? A logical impossibility would be something that is impossible in virtue of the logic involved, or if you know the definition of the terms, you'll know it's impossible. So Mm -hmm. a married bachelor is impossible because all that means is a man who is married and not married at the same time. M squiggly line M, M not M. Yes. We just did all our little symbolic logic (laughs) and such. Um, And we know you can't have X and not X at the same time. Metaphysical impossibility gets a bit squishier though, as to what, which is there's things that seem to be impossible that you do, you can't just logically write out. Uh, one, I have two examples in my head that I like to put out. Well, a classic one, I think it comes from Plantinga, is uh, the, the prime minister is not a prime number. Yeah, the probability of your cognitive faculties being reliable. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, by the way, everyone, Joe has earned a rep online for doing impersonations <laughs> of different philosophers. I hear you do a mean Richard Swinburne. <laughs> yeah, that is to say. Uh, <laughs> that yeah. is to say that, well, God is a being, is a person without a body. So that's, <laughs> we'll see if anything else, uh, anything else uh, comes up. I don't know. Have you, have you worked on a Craig yet? Craig, I think, is pretty uh, imitatable. That's, it- yeah, I mean, that one's a little difficult because he has just kind of your generic Midwestern almost. Um, so that's hard, but it's a <laughs> when he's... major, physical measures of time, space-less, time-less, immaterial, enormously powerful. Uh, so <laughs> I, I think he has a very like kind of a debate mode that I think yeah. would be easy to, um, to impersonate. So, yeah. um, uh, right. So, when, so metaphysical impossibility, like another example I think of is a, an object that has a color but doesn't have a shape. Like yeah. for me, I would say, at first you think, well, can it, could an object have color but not have shape? Now, there's no lo- strict logical contradiction here, but what you know about shape and color is, well, wait, if I could identify its color, it would have some kind of shape to contain the color. I don't see how you could have one without the other. Other examples might be um, going back in time, changing the past, returning to the same point in a timeline on the same timeline Th- things like that. So like for me, then for omnipotence, I would say God can't do the logical or the metaphysically impossible. Mm-hmm. Though then you get in a lot of debates about what is, you know, what's that, you know? Yeah, so, exactly. Um, let's jump into the next one. Then two other uh, incompatible properties arguments. 
the next one would be uh, divine hiddenness. Uh, this is an argument made famous by J.L. Schellenberg. The idea here, and uh, Ben actually brought this up in our debate, and there's two different ways you can run this argument. And when you come to these kinds of arguments against God, like theism, you can have arguments that, that prove God exists or prove he doesn't exist, or arguments that make God really probable or really improbable. So these next two arguments we'll talk about, there are versions that say, well, it makes it really, really improbable, or it's just a flat out proof. And Ben, in my debate with him, he seemed to run, as Schellenberg does, kind of a proof argument that basically yeah. if God exists, um, then he desires a relationship with rational creatures. Uh, therefore, there will be no um, non-rational resistant believers, uh, essentially. Sorry, there's no rational resistant believers. Non-resistant. Non-resistant, yes. There we go. Rational, not, yeah, you're right. So the idea here is there could be people that just hate God for weirdo reasons. You know, yeah. God can't necessarily, <laughs> whatever, they're a weirdo. In all possible worlds, they're going to show up somewhere. But there are people who are rational and they're, they're not resistant to God. They would like God to exist, but he, they just don't come to that conclusion. And Schellenberg and Ben in our debate said, those people won't exist. And those people clearly do exist. Therefore, God does not exist. There are these, pe these people who don't believe in God, who are rational, who would li very much like God to exist. And I would say yourself, well, I mean, I would imagine you're probably this way. There are some theists, non-theists who don't want God to exist. They don't like that idea. But like Ben seems to very much want the, um, at least the God of generic theism uh, to exist. He would think mm -hmm. that'd be a very good thing. Uh, so Schellenberg and Ben's argument is that people like him exist, if God existed, there wouldn't be people like him, but people like him do exist. So there's different ways Christians have responded to this. I'm very against the view, which is popular in some reform circles, that yeah. actually they all secretly believe in God. <laughs> They're just sinfully suppressing it or lying to your face. I find that highly implausible. I operate under this assumption. Reality is the way it appears. This is good. Actually, this came up in my debate with Matt Dillahunty. I don't know if you saw that. That was, um, that was interesting. I um, saw portions of it, and um, I was cringing at, at many points. Uh, <laughs> not because of you. <laughs> well, because I brought up this question with Matt. I said, well, Matt, should we just say reality is, the, we should treat reality as it appears unless evidence suggests otherwise. And he just, I think like he was just in a mode where I can't agree with anything Trent says because he'll <laughs> use it to trap me. And I'm like, dude, I'm starting with the most basic way of living. And if we yeah. can't believe that, you're like one step away from being schizophrenic. If like, yeah. you can't just, I'm not saying we all believe things as they appear. Like, I don't really think the magician saw the lady in half, but I have evidence to suggest otherwise. Like, the, like magicians aren't arrested after that happens. You know? um, so yeah, I, you're probably not going to escape skepticism if you don't accept something like that. <laughs> yeah, just a very basic way of, of, of operating. So when I see someone like Ben who presents himself as a, a rational, non-resistant believer, I don't have evidence that really does suggest otherwise. Yet you don't think this is a slam dunk argument that shows there is no God. Yeah. I mean, I also, so one thing I just want to add to your response there to the people in sort of maybe the more reformed tradition who says, ah, no, they're all resistant. I mean, some of these non-resistant non-believers are non-believers because they don't even have like the relevant concepts involved. Be like take, go back, uh, or maybe even right now, go to like some isolated Amazonian tribesmen who aren't even right. connected to the external world. They've never heard of the Bible. They don't, probably don't, some of them probably might not even have a concept of a God. Maybe they have some kind of concept of a, a pantheistic great spirit, maybe that like pervades, you know, right. they might, a lot of people, especially in our evolutionary history. So we know like humans have been around for a long time and right. uh, certainly predating certain like, kind of highfalutin theoretical concepts of God and so on. Um, and uh, uh, a philosopher named um, uh, Teddy Smith has a paper in the Austral philosophy. And like he, he traced out certain beliefs over our history. And actually animism is more popular as a kind of guiding principle for certain um, tribes and groups of people versus like a kind of more theistic or pantheist, you know, those sorts of things. And so like, mm -hmm. if that's the case, well, then it seems as though like a lot of people are non-resistant, non-believers in God for like, because they don't even have the concept, you know? Right. It's like, Has it's not as though they're that. repressing it in sin. Um, so yeah, that, that's so just why, another... Yeah. So then another the question reason. is, why do these people exist? And the hard argument from divine hiddenness would just say, well, they exist because 
God doesn't exist doesn't is exist. the only explanation, but not necessarily so. Yeah, no, that, that's absolutely right. So like, I mean, one thing that you could probably always say at this juncture is like, um, especially with the incompatibility argument where it's like, oh no, there's an incompatibility between God's existence and such people. Is it, well, hold on a second. I mean, maybe God has some morally sufficient reason, right? For allowing this kind of hiddenness for a given time in a person's life. Um, maybe that will allow for certain profound goods to accrue to this individual and their relationship with God in the afterlife, or maybe some later point in their life or, and so on. Um, so I don't know, we need to be given some reason to rule out God's having some morally sufficient reason for allowing um, certain people to go through these non-resistant spells of non-belief. Uh, and, and so unless and until we're given some reason to think that God couldn't have such morally sufficient reason, uh, then I think that at least the incompatibility version of the divine hiddenness argument just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's yeah. one response, but sure. I, I have a few others. But uh, Right. Um, you could always share a few others. I have um, a few thoughts of my own on this. I'm going to bracket actually this and the problem of evil for another one. I, 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 that's a response that I would generally agree with that I think a lot of the replies will mirror some of the replies to the problem of evil. I, I do think that one, two things on, on my mind, one would be similar to the problem of evil, like God gives us moral freedom. I think he also gives us cognitive freedom. And so if we have cognitive freedom, we might make serious cognitive errors in our, in our discerning about reality. And kind of related to that is, I'm not so sure even if God existed or, you know, say, well, God makes his existence obvious. It may still be the case people will deny God exists because at least in the modern world, there are people who deny things that I think are, are patently obvious. Uh, so a few examples would be uh, the, the Churchland's eliminative materialism. Uh, Paul and Patricia Churchland would not say, I have a headache today. It'd say, uh, oh, my head is experiencing inflammation right now, you know, like denying that there actually is an immaterial self or denying uh, temporal becoming. Um, are you still kind of leaning towards a theory of time, by the way? <laughs> yeah, I'm very lukewarm presentist, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> no, that, yeah. Yeah, that's another future. Um... But I have a lot of respect for eternalism. Oh, yeah. sure. Well, that's why I'm, yeah. I'm kind of in between both camps. I'm kind of black sheep. I sort of lean towards the, the growing block view. No, no one would let me, I'm not as, I wouldn't be as ostracized as the spotlight theory. Those, yeah, those are the kids that can't get any seat yeah. at the lunch table. <laughs> uh, growing block has some yeah, decent and people. And for good though. reason. Yeah, right. <laughs> growing block it though, I, I have um, an affinity for that, but that'll be a different conversation um, with us. But, but uh, the consciousness, or I think even just that I have free will. Like, uh, I think most people believe they do have free will until they read a book by Sam Harris or hear about the Libet experiments. But like, there's things that just seem really obvious, like just totally like with us that people still doubt. So I, I think sometimes now you might say, well, God, he's omnipotent after all. He's going he's gonna to make his existence obvious in some beatific way. But I think we would eventually go back to he could still have those good reasons. Yeah, I think probably the most fundamental response is indeed just bottoming out and like, they're the ones giving a positive argument here, the, the proponents of the hiddenness argument. And so they're the ones who need to give us good reason to think that God couldn't have these morally sufficient reasons for being hidden in the way that he is. Now, that things get more complicated when you move to like the Bayesian forms of the argument, because um, then, although it might be a possibility that God has some morally sufficient reason, um, we have to ask about how expected is the, or how expected is the data on the hypothesis. But before getting, or before we move on, I just want to touch on another response to the hiddenness sure. argument um, that, uh, well, at least as, as Ben presented it in your guys' debate and as Schellenberg puts it, it requires a premise to the effect that um, a, a relationship, a meaningful, significant relationship with God, a necessary precondition for that is belief in God. Mm. I, I just reject that flat out. Um, I think that meaningful, significant relationship does not require an explicit cognitive belief that the other party uh, exists. I mean, okay, well, I mean, one example is just a mundane example. I mean, you know, um, uh, a pregnant lady with uh, uh, her, her fetus, right? That relationship there, even though the fetus isn't cognizant of, of the mom um, and even maybe a newborn and so on. Uh, I think that there's, that's a really significant, meaningful relationship, even though one of the parties is not cognizant of, of the other. Now, someone might say, oh, well, that's not the most significant. That's not, there, there's still a more significant relationship that you could have, and God would try to secure that. But like, even, I mean, I, th I would respond in this way to that. Well, like, there are some cases where um, I think that we could be in a relationship with God, even though we don't have an explicit belief in God. I think someone who's 
trying their utmost to seek beauty, to seek goodness, to seek truth, uh, mm -hmm. to, to, to try to cultivate the moral virtues, the intellectual virtues. Um, someone who is doing that is thereby in a relationship with God uh, because they're, I mean, God is, is, he's perfectly good. He's perfectly beautiful. He's perfectly true and, and so on. Like you're thereby in a relationship with God by seeking these sorts mm -hmm. of things, by desiring them, by, by doing your utmost to cultivate those virtues and, and, and so on. So I think someone who does that is thereby in a relationship with God. Oh, this is the other point that it reminds me of, that sometimes I'm concerned, and this is a good segue into the problem of evil a little bit, that I, I feel like what's interesting, I'll comment on both the problem of evil and the divine hiddenness argument. I have a concern that there is a bit of a modern bias in our moral intuitions behind the argument. Now, it is, I think it runs something like this, that we trust our modern moral intuitions because oftentimes in the past, people were incorrect about their moral intuitions uh, when they promoted certain barbaric behavior or things like that. And thank goodness we've made moral progress. So sometimes we, we think that either moral intuitions have improved or they've remained stagnant. We're less likely to think that as time has gone on, certain moral intuitions have gotten worse. Uh, but I'm not sure that's the case. Look at any of the comment fields on YouTube. Uh, I think that there's the case actually that many people's moral intuitions about how to treat others have gotten worse over time because of certain uh, things in the modern world. So because of that, I think some moral intuitions that we have about uh, the kind of relationship I am owed by another person who loves me, or if someone creates a world, the kind of life they ought to give me we might have the wrong into it. We might have kind of a modern, I don't want to say spoiled because there are some horrendous evils that have their own theodicy we have to talk about. But we have, like, for example, like I'll know people who will give up belief in God because they see people who are handicapped or who are starving in Africa. And yet what's ironic is that the starving people in Africa or the handicapped person often, often. do believe in God. And so it, seemed, it seems odd to me that for some people, observing evil makes them doubt, or a hiddenness makes them doubt God. But some people in the midst of it, they don't. Do you see where I'm coming from with that observation? Yeah. And I mean, I'm just thinking, because there are so many different complex psychological factors that are at play here, too, on both parties. So like, I'll just, I'll, I'll refrain from speculating on that. But I do think it's an interesting Well, I, I do think, because I think, okay, a rejoinder is that the starving people in Africa, Trent, they got to believe in God, because without it, they'll just snap. And they, yeah. this is essentially something that keeps their boat afloat. Yeah. And so that's the reason people throughout history who suffered more still believed in God uh, is because um, they needed it to keep their boat afloat and we don't have to. Mm -hmm. I'm not necessarily convinced by that response either because I feel like, like, let's say you have a friend who constantly lets you down. It's not like your response is, I have to believe my friend is actually pulling through because I couldn't imagine being so friendless and awful. I think when some entity or institution continually lets us down, eventually it gets such a bad reputation over time, um, we do discard it. And I, I, th I would think something similar would happen with God. Obviously, we're treading into psychological explanations. I don't necessarily want to do that. But I think that when we think about how God, going back to the divine hiddenness argument, we think, oh, well, if God loved me, I could pray and it'd almost be like I'm having it. And this might be because of American evangelicalism. I could just, <laughs> he'd, be, he'd be right there on the, the prayer phone and I could always get a hold of him. But like when you read the writings <laughs> of the saints throughout history, they, a lot of them, um, St. John of the Cross, even St. I was reading Therese Anselm. Was, I was, I, if I can inter yeah, go interject, ahead. Go ahead. I yes. was reading Anselm last night and um, he was like saying at the beginning of one of his like, meditations and philosophical explorations it's like um he was asking god why are you so hidden from me why when i seek i do not find you and ah. why and he was like saying that and he's like it was really interesting to, to read what he's saying and um and you know he goes on to talk about um faith seeking understanding and you know all right. these other sorts of things in anselm so but like i just wanted to add that uh, that's in an Anselm. and this is the guy who says god is the being that which no greater can be thought he is the, exactly. the maximal theism and yet for anselm's definition god is not lesser in his being merely because he has less i don't know if i'm using the vocabulary right in epistemology like doxastic uh type of relationship that mm -hmm. conscious awareness of the relationship where it might be something more fundamental. And I liked your analogy of, well, maybe God is relating to people, giving them what they need, and if he's all-knowing, then he 
He knows what they, what they need, even if they don't. Yeah, and I mean, if I can add to this, this mm-hmm. is not like some sort of ad hoc maneuver to try to get out of it. I mean, uh, take Matthew 25, for instance. So I actually prepared, I prepared two quotations. The one of them is from Matthew 25, yeah, and sure. I'd like to read it uh, because Go I ahead. think it's beautiful, uh, pertains to uh, divine goodness. So um, then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of these least brothers of mine, you did for me. I just think that's, that's showing that like, by loving our neighbor, by seeking truth, by seeking beauty, by seeking goodness, by trying to cultivate these virtues, you are thereby in a relationship with God, in a relationship with God. And perhaps, perhaps there are some unique goods that can accrue from that from someone who doesn't have that doxastic, explicit belief. Um, it's like precisely in spite of not being certain of God's existence, in spite of that, they still seek they still seek, they still desire, they have that flaming desire, they have, they're still looking into these issues, they're still trying to mm-hmm. cultivate their virtue and their character, even though they don't know if, if, um, if they're going to be rewarded for it, if they don't know if God exists and is there, like, there's something beautiful about that, there's something so valuable about that, mm-hmm. so um, that, that's one quote, and then the second one is deeply related, and you can totally tell that uh, C.S. Lewis was just totally uh, plagiarizing here from uh, uh, Matthew 25, but <laughs> so it's um, in the C.S. public domain. Yeah, exactly. I put it in public domain. For uh, yeah, exactly. So um, C.S. Lewis in The Last Battle says this background to this, but people can can understand it without understanding. the. the it's, story. it's the last book in the Narnia series. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So here's the quote. Then I fell at his feet. So that his we're talking about Aslan here. So then I fell at his feet and thought, surely this is the hour of death for the lion who is worthy of all honor will know that I've served Tash, which is like the evil character. Um, will know that I've served Tash all my days and not him. Nevertheless, it is better to see the lion and die than to live and not to have seen him. But the glorious one bent down his golden head and touched my forehead and said, son, thou art welcome. But I said, alas, Lord, I am no son of thine, but the servant of Tash. He answered, child, all the service thou hast done to Tash, I account as service done to me. Then by reasons of my great desire for wisdom, standing, I overcame my fear and questioned the glorious one and said, Lord, is it then true as the ape said that thou and Tash are one? The lion grabbed the earth, shook, but his wrath was not against me, and said, it is false, not because he and I are one, but because we are opposites. I take to me the services which thou hast done to him. For I and he are of such different kinds that no service which is vile can be done to me, and none which is not vile can be done to him. Therefore, if any man swear by Tash and keep his oath for the oath's sake, it is by me that he has truly sworn, though he know it not. And it is I who reward him. And if any man do a cruelty in my name, then though he says the name Aslan, it is Tash whom he serves. And by Tash, his deed is accepted. Dost thou understand, child? I said, Lord, thou knowest how much I understand. But I said also, for the truth constrained me, yet I've been seeking Tash all my days. Beloved, said the God, unless thy desire had been for me, thou wouldst not have sought so long and so truly, for all find what they truly seek. End quote. So I'm like... Mm. This is, this is so related to divine hiddenness. I mean, like, it's, it's precisely in, in seeking and cultivating these things that you're in a relationship with Aslan, with, with God. And, and even if you don't have that kind of explicit doxastic cognitive component there. So anyway. Well, I think, you know, what's funny, I think you've given better advice to people who struggle with their relationship with God than a lot of other people who do believe in God, actually, right <laughs> now. So kudos to you, my friend. Uh, yeah, that you could be in relationship with God by pers- God is the good. If you're having trouble seeking God, God. seek the good. Mm-hmm. They're, con- they're convertible things, goodness and being. I'll ask you a little bit about that here in a sec. But let's just talk about, um, let's talk about evil, because that's the stock, mm-hmm. most potent argument, both philosophically and also um, personally for, for many people. Uh, that it's two forms, one that make God very unlikely, but then the stronger one is it's impossible. God and evil are, are lot, would definitely prove atheism. Um, and it seems like we kind of run a similar parallel argument to hiddenness. Well, if, you know, how do we know God does not have good reasons for evil? It seems like it might count against God, sure, but not necessarily enough to decisively re- refute the case. What do you think? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, like like you said, there are so <laughs> there are so many different versions of the problem yes. of evil. Like um, the kind of evil that you're focused on, you could focus on human evil. You could focus on non-human or you know human suffering, non-human animal suffering. Um, you could focus on certain social evil that Ted Poston, I think that's how you pronounce it. Mm -hmm. might be posted but i think it's posted and like social evil that arises from certain like um game theoretic interactions like there are so many different versions and they're like bayesian forms inductive forms uh, abductive forms uh, deductive logical forms so it's like yeah we, we can't hope for the audience we can't hope to scratch the surface here but um right. but yeah for like the logical version uh, it traditionally you know goes back to like Mackie. and he said um like hey god's omnipotent omniscient and perfectly good uh, and if he's omnipotent, well, then, uh, and omnipotent, there are no limits to what an omnipotent being can do. And so God could eradicate all evil. Moreover, he knows about it because he's omniscient. And because he's perfectly good, uh, s something is good to the extent that it eliminates evil as far as it can. And so given all, all of it, there's simply no evil. But yet, there's evil. Look around us. Uh, so God does not exist. And that's a kind of logical argument because we're starting from these concepts of goodness and, and so on. Now, um, most philosophers these days uh, don't think that that argument succeeds. I don't think it succeeds either. Um, Firstly, there are limits on what an omnip omnipotent being can do. I mean, there are certain um, metaphysical and logical necessities. So there might be certain uh, goods that are necessarily tied to certain evils, such that you couldn't get the profound good without having some evil first, you know, like uh, courage in the face of threats and uh, overcoming temptation, you know, other sorts of things, forgiveness and these other sorts of great goods. And moreover, uh, it seems to me that it's false that a good thing uh, eliminates evil as far as it can, because there's a balance between promoting good and eliminating yeah, and evil. to to add a reply, I think some of these people might say, "Well, God could create courage and and forgiveness and something that's akin to a simulation, where you know it looks like danger, but it isn't. It seems like people have been wronged, but they haven't." And I just don't see that that's plausible because I would say they aren't actually. It's the appearance of the goods but they're not good themselves. It reminds me of a thought experiment from the philosopher. Oh, yeah, the experience machine. Yeah, by yeah. Robert Nozick, uh, which you, to ask people, and I could ask the audience, I, I want to turn this into some kind of meme, but I feel like the two people that play the game would you rather the most are like drunk college students and philosophers. All right. Yes. Would you rather live in a world like, we, which, is, which is the little experience machine, would you rather live in the world as it is now or would you rather be plugged into the matrix and have everything you ever wanted? Uh, and I think most, pe most people, not necessarily all, but I think most people would not want the matrix. I would not want that because there is something good beyond just the appearance of good. The, the actual goodness itself uh, is more valuable. And as you said, some of those goods are concomitant. They go along with uh, evils and you can't have one without the other. But you're right. I mean, we could we could do a whole thing just on um, the problem of evil. And there's different replies to Mackey. Uh, some people think, I think it's hard. Some people will listen to William Lane Craig and think there's only one reply, which would be yeah. planting a, well, there's, the problem is there are counterfactuals of creaturely freedom that, you know, say, well, there's, you know, Joe has, you know, just to brief our audience, a counterfactual of creaturely freedom is this. If Joe is free, then if Joe meets Sue's mother-in-law, he's going to be rude. That's just something about Joe God can't change. So if God makes Joe or other versions of Joe, they'll, they'll have different counterfactuals. And, there is, and so planting it says, well, there, there just is no world where there, there are creatures that don't have, there might not be, there, at least there might not be a world where creatures don't have these propensities. And this gets us into trans world depravity and these, these yeah. kinds of things. I just like the simpler thing, like what you uttered, as I said, kind of my debate with Ben, I just think God, he's within his, he's justified to allow evil if he brings these greater goods. And some evils, I prefer, I think it's better to have a world that goes from imperfect to perfect than one that's just flat out perfect. But there's always a lot more. Let's, let's get to some yeah, of the, and I mean, go ahead, go ahead. For the yeah. audience, I did just want to say really briefly that like, like again, there are so many different versions. And we've, we've mainly focused on the logical one and there are certain Bayesian ones that uh, I think are much more powerful than the logical one, but we don't have like 30 hours, so. <laughs> yeah, now the Bayesian, to get to our, our listeners, um, and this is always, I feel like, the concern when you, you know, philosophers and other people uh, discuss amongst themselves. I never want to leave people behind. The yeah. idea here is, all right, maybe the arguments from evil or divine hiddenness, it doesn't disprove God, but it just 
I'll give you a, an example. I think I wrote in a book a while ago. I once went to a football game uh, with my wife, or I went. It was with somebody. Maybe it wasn't my wife, but it was somebody. And I, and I got home and they said, oh, what happened? And I said, oh, uh, our team got destroyed. And they said, oh, what was the final score? And I said, um, I, I don't know. I imagine it was probably something close to like 37 to 7. There's only two minutes left. And they said, well, how do you, I, I said, it was so depressing. I didn't stay to the end of the game. And they said, well, how do you know that they lost? All right, fine. I'm not 100% certain they lost, but if you know how football runs, it's pretty much impossible. That's how these other, for our listeners, these probabilistic arguments against God, evil, hiddenness. Uh, I, I don't want to explore that because it'll take us too long. I just want to share one thing that uh, concerns me a little when the probabilistic arguments enter the table. I feel like sometimes if you, I just don't know how valuable it is to discuss single um, probabilistic arguments because it seems like if we're discussing whether God exists and it's a probabilistic thing, then we've got to put all of the things on the table, right? You can have evil, divine hiddenness, but then what about the contingency of the universe, you know, moral awareness, uh, you know, it's, it's, do you think like, and, and I think sometimes Christians can do this too. If you focus on just one probabilistic argument, I feel like it's only fair to put it all on the table in one thing, like what Richard Swinburne does. In existence uh, yeah. of God. Yeah, I think that's the correct, the absolutely correct approach um, that we need to have a kind of holistic ex- like assessment. And you can't just focus on just one Bayesian argument, say you need to focus on the whole range of, of evidence and see which um, hypothesis does the best in terms of its intrinsic probability and then in terms of predicting or explaining yeah. how the data. So. The other thing that concerns me is, and I, I guess I'm of the school, I'm just, I kind of more like deductive arguments and, and things like that. I understand the problem, and some people really like these inductive Bayesian arguments. I get a little bit concerned, especially if we're, let's say we have like 10 or 12 variables, like all the fine tuning, animal suffering, human suffering, divine hiddenness, theistic religious experience. I I feel like I understand. So Bayesian arguments work well, like when you're dealing with, let's say in medicine, what are the odds that, that, uh, Frank will develop prostate cancer. Well, you have his family history is this percentage, and this is this percentage, that percentage, and you put it in the little math formula. But I, I kind of worry that if we do all this for something like proofs for God, we're really shooting from the hip to try to assign the numerical values to everything. Like maybe we could do more than 50% or 50%. less than 50%, but I don't know. That's a concern I have. I don't know what you, what you think of yeah, that. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's certainly going to be difficult if not impossible in many cases, to give some kind of precise numerical value. But what's nice about Bayesianism is that if you use the, well, sorry for the audience, but if you use the odds form of Bayes' theorem, what really matters is comparing how likely certain data is on the theory. So as long as, you don't need to assign specific, uh, specific numerical values, but as long as one hypothesis, you can argue that it makes much better sense of the data. It predicts the data much, much better than another mm. hypothesis. Even if you don't have some kind of numerical value, that's actually all you need to say that the relevant data give evidence for one hypothesis over the other. Sometimes you can actually get more quantitative. So in like the fine tuning arguments, you know, you you might be able to give certain um, quantitative values and so on. And, um, but I do think think that there are ways around worries like that, that, Mm -hmm. but, but you know, the general worry is correct that we don't have these kind of very precise values that we can assign. So I think that's in general uh, Mm -hmm. correct. Uh, Let's go then to last question for you. Um, cause you say there, even though you're not convinced by arguments for atheism, there can be rational atheists or some strong, ar- strong arguments there, even if they don't convince you flipping it around for theism. Uh, what are some arguments for theism? And you stipulated to me that are fun and plausible. There could yes. be an argument that's fun. <laughs> like I think the, I think the, the general ontological argument is fun. The, the general ontological argument. I just don't find it quite plausible. Uh, then there's others. And I guess this will get into ontological arguments a lot that are plausible. Who is the guy? It's Hartshorn or someone had like an 80 step ontological <laughs> argument. <laughs> yeah, someone, someone published a book somewhat recently where they were formalizing Anselm's version and, <laughs> and it was over like 230 oh. premises. And, it, and, <laughs> and so, just, yes, just, it could be plausible, but it's not fun to get through. So <laughs> arguments for theism you find to be fun and plausible, even if they don't convince you, they, they could point in that direction. Yeah, yeah. for the audience, I stipulated that um, we have to make it fun and plausible by my lights. So like, I, I've just put down two. 
um, that I think are fun and plausible that I think weigh in favor of theism. Like I said, I'm, I'm firstly an epistemic agnostic, but also an agnostic who thinks that there are significant evidential considerations that do in fact favor both, both theism and naturalism. So these are just two things. The one of them is I put uh, an explanatory sticker for the modal ontological argument. Um, so I, a lot of, or some people in the audience might know that I went on Capturing Christianity with um, Alex O'Connor, a cosmic skeptic, to discuss this uh, symptom breaker. It's in a paper of mine that's currently under review. And um, let me just explain the general, I'll be brief, I won't be too long. So um, the modal ontological argument just says, possibly God exists, or possibly a perfect being exists, where again, a, a perfect being is just um, a necessarily existing perfect being that has all perfections essentially and lacks imperfections essentially. So um, possibly there is such a thing as this. And therefore actually there is such a thing as that. Now that sounds like a leap, but actually there's a system of modal logic that is pretty much taken for, uh, to be the, the right one by, by most philosophers and metaphysicians. It's called S5. And by S5, you can actually go from the possible necessity of something to it's just necessity. You can kind of shave off that possibility. So if you say that it's possibly necessary that God exists, well, then you can actually just shave off that possibly and say, hey, necessarily God exists. The idea is basically a necessity exists no matter what, in all ways that reality could be, in all possible worlds. And so if this being exists in one world, well, then how could, it how could a necessary being exist in that world if it didn't exist in all the worlds, right? Because to be a necessary being is to exist in all possible worlds. And so if there were some world that it failed to exist in, well, then it wouldn't actually be necessary in this one other world. So if we're saying it's possible that there's a necessary being in some other world, well, then actually mm. that being populates all the worlds. Yeah, so, so that, and so that, and let me set you up for the T, and hopefully I've set you up for the T right, right. where I'm running with my thinking with this, is that the premise that, pe that philosophers dispute in the first premise of the modal ontological argument is that first premise. It's actually the one that most lay people would think is the least controversial, but yeah. actually it's the most controversial. Yeah. Namely, it is possible God exists because they'll say, guys, you've been talking about that this whole time. Of course it's possible. Well, there's two kinds of possibility. There's epistemic. Yeah, for all we know, there's a God. Uh, and then there's metaphysical, like God, he either exists or he doesn't exist. It's sort of like on a roulette table. It's possible the ball will be black. Well, I guess I could think about this. It's possible there's a roulette table that is pink and black. I don't know. Somebody could have made it out there. I don't know. Uh, that's epistemic. Metaphysical would be when you play roulette, it is possible the ball will bounce in black. We know what roulette is. And so we know it's going to be red or it's going to be black. It has to be one of the two. The problem is not everyone's convinced that God is that metaphysically possible. Either he, it is possible or he isn't. And so the biggest critique of the modal ontological argument is that you can run a parody or an inverted argument. The old argument, the old parody of it is, oh, if there's this great being, there's also a great island, whatever. Uh, but the modal ontological argument tries to get around that. And the anti-modal ontological argument will say, well, look, if it's metaphysically possible that God does not exist, there is, if there's a possible world where there is no God, and if, it's ne and if the absence of God is a necessary truth, by S5, well then, in every world, there is no God. So that's the biggest um, objection to the modal ontological argument, that there is a symmetry. Yeah. That like, look, if you could use this, that the problem is, if the, the logic proves there is a God, it also equally proves there isn't a God, so the argument's useless, unless somebody could come up with a symmetry breaker to show that, no, 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 there's something different about how it shows there is a God versus that there isn't. And you think people are, it, there's interesting ways people try to do that. Absolutely, yeah, so that was, that was perfect. So yeah, you have these two competing possibility premises. One, possibly there is a perfect being, and the other one, possibly there is no perfect being. These seem like, roughly a par on epistemic par perhaps it would be see it would seem horribly arbitrary to just <laughs> put stomp that one of them is true and the other one isn't without some kind of other reasons to, to adduce so you need some kind of if you want to privilege one over the other uh, especially if you want to privilege one over the other in an argument uh, then you need to be you need to give some kind of reason for that you need to break that symmetry and so uh yeah so i think they're interesting symmetry breakers i think they're all really fun to think about um i have reservations for most of them but one of them i think um Succeeds now. It doesn't succeed in proving, like deductively, that uh, the the theistic possibility premise is true. But I think it gives you some what what philosophers call defeasible reason, which is like all else being equal, it gives you some reason to prefer this possibility premise over that one. So mm -hmm. it's not saying it's not like a deductive like demonstration, like one plus one equals two, like not that that this one is to be preferred. Which one but is it's that more, then? 
it starts with the defeasible rule of thumb that gets our gears turning. So like just in general, things generally have explanations in terms of other things. So that's just a general, that's just a general principle. Like things generally have explanations in terms of other things. So like take the fact that there are turtles. Well, this fact has an explanation. I mean, we can cite certain selection pressures and ancestral organisms that brought it about like, or planets, right? Planets don't, uh, aren't some kind of inexplicable thing. The planets come from prior accretion disks and other sorts of dust and, and gradual effects and so on. So in general, we see an explanatory order around this. We see that things are explained in general by other things. So that's a kind of defeasible rule of thumb. I'm not saying, uh, I'm not saying everything has to have an outside explanation. I'm not saying um, a certain class of things have to have an outside explanation. I'm just saying in general, we expect there to be an explanation and there's a kind of presumption in favor of there being an explanation. Explanation is the, the guide. It's a, it's, so it sounds like you're putting forward a, a relaxed principle of sufficient reason. Yeah, absolutely. So this allows there, this prin- for all this principle says, there could be inexplicable things. There could be um, you know, uncaused beginnings, unexplained beginnings. All it's saying is that there's a, 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 a pr- presumption in favor of there being an explanation. Uh, science relies on that, I think. Uh, our ordinary common sense reasoning relies on that. Um, if you hear pitter pattering at midnight and some of the cheese is gone and, and there's a little hole in your wall, uh, you're probably not going to take well, seriously. That's kind of like no what I said earlier with you, what I said with Dillahunty, the way you should live. Things are as they appear unless evidence suggests otherwise. And that's rooted on the fact that if certain things happen, they seem to be routed to explanations. Like, like they seem to go together. Exactly. That's, a, that's exactly the principle that you just said. That is precisely the kind of defeasible principle that I'm saying. It's saying generally, such is the case, unless you're given some positive reason right. to disrupt that. So yeah, generally things have explanations. So what I want to do is I want to, let's weaken that even further. <laughs> so generally things possibly have explanations. Okay, so I'm not even saying that generally things actually have explanations. It's just in general, there's a presumption in favor of at least the possibility of an explanation, okay? Uh, I think all the reasons that favor the, the slightly stronger version favor this because it's entailed by the first one. Right. And, uh, moreover, I think that there are certain modal principles that favor this. So like um, whenever we're presented with something that we don't have positive reason to think must be inexplicable, well, I mean, we can at least conceive of there being an explanation. Typically, um, we can conceive of something that produced it. I mean, uh, I don't think conceivability entails possibility. I think that's false, but I think it gives us at least some reason to think that something is possible if it's conceivable. Um, and so, and there are other modal epistemological tools. So like tools for probing possibility and necessity. So once we have that principle on the table, we'll now take the fact that there are imperfect things. And by an imperfect thing, I mean something that's not perfect. So something that's perfect, as I defined it earlier, is just a kind of like necessary being that has all perfections essentially and lacks all perfections. Or it lacks all imperfections essentially. Mm-hmm. And so um, now we can focus on imperfect things. I focused on turtles earlier, planets earlier, but now let's apply this principle to imperfect things. Given our principle that in general, things possibly have explanations in terms of other things. Well, we can apply that to the fact that there are imperfect things. Uh, and so there's a defeasible presumption in favor of the possibility of an outside explanation of imperfect things. And of course, the only thing that could explain imperfect things is something that's perfect. You can't explain imperfect things in, in terms of something that's imperfect. That's just, you're citing the, very, just like you can't explain why there are any turtles by citing a turtle. So, um, right, you need something else. Outside. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So that, that would deliver us the possibility of a perfect being because the fact that there are imperfect things, we have a general reason to think that that's possibly explained. And the only possible explanation is a perfect thing. Mm-hmm. And so there's some possible world. I'm not saying that it's actual yet. There's some possible world in which there's a perfect thing. Uh, and by S5, <laughs> you get that there is actually a perfect thing because this, is, this thing is a necessary thing. That's by definition as I kind of um, mm-hmm. was spelling out what it is. And so I, I think this is interesting. I think it's fun. I think it gives a defeasible reason that mm-hmm. favors the theistic possibility premise. Um, and yeah, I, I find it really plausible. I address many different objections in, in my paper, but uh, yeah. That's one of that's the first one that I want to talk about. Well, that the, it reminds me a little bit of the symmetry breaker on the question. You know, there's a classic question: Why is there something rather than nothing? And one reply to that is to say, well, we could, if there were nothing, we could ask the similar question: Why is there nothing rather than something? Uh, so it's just not an interesting fact to support theism. Why is there something rather than nothing? Because there are nothing, we would ask the same question. But it seems like there's a symmetry breaker to say, no, something requires explanation. The absence of things don't require an explanation unless there's other positive evidence to, to assume they would be there. Like, for example, if I'm walking down the, like, 
if I'm going in my house, I don't say, why isn't there a dog barking? Because we don't own a dog. Yeah. Uh, there's now, if there were a dog barking, I'd say, why is there a dog barking? Uh, you know, so the, why I don't ask why there isn't a dog barking because there's nothing positive to require an explanation for that negative state of affairs. But if I were um, walking and I saw a dog house and a leash and the, the kibble freshly poured and sirens going off, I might say like, well, why isn't the dog barking with all of this? You know, or like, let's say I had a dog and someone breaks in, they're getting in the house. Like, why didn't the dog bark to let me know this is going on? <laughs> Uh, so it kind of reminds me of that, you know, of, of trying to um, sort out that there's, there's a different kind of explanation that we asked for in the symmetry. So that's an interesting one. I mean, and I'll be excited to, um, to read the paper. Yeah. Uh, I, I just want to say like, it, ahead, does, yeah. it does connect to a lot of other, um, it's similar to a lot of different arguments that uh, other people have developed. I think I, uh, what I try to do is I just apply it in a new context of, of symmetry breaking and the modal mm -hmm. ontological argument and so on. Like, um, some people, like uh, Alex Proust and Richard Gale, for instance, they have what we might call a modalized contingency argument. So they use a kind of PSR, and it's, it's different than the one that I was explaining. But they try to argue that uh, it's possible that there's a necessary being because they have this um, modal PSR where uh, contingent things are possibly explained. And um, mm -hmm. it, so it's somewhat similar to other moves that have been made. But I, what I argue in the paper is that there are certain unique benefits that accrue from mine uh, that derive from the defeasibility, that derive from... Um, the type of fact that I want to explain. So I don't, I don't say that um, every fact whatsoever has an explanation. Remember what I said? I, I said, generally things uh, have an explanation. Then the, the big conjunctive contingent. Yeah, exactly. That thing is demanding is an explanation. <laughs> yeah. And, and also, yeah, well, anyway. I'm sorry, yeah. folks, we're geeking out of it, but it's really <laughs> fun for me to, it's fun to do that um, with anyone, frankly, whether they uh, <laughs> yeah. agree or, um, or disagree. That's why I actually... Yeah, we got to have you come down to um, capturing Christianity V two, um, because I had a blast. This was at the this was the debate I do with Ben Watkins. Everyone at this is in Houston. I was at the capturing Christianity conference, and I will tell you, um, it was a blast to sit around with Ben and Josh Rasmussen and just like chat about yeah. stuff like this. So maybe Cam will bring you in, and um, we'll have to have I, some. I believe I'm going to come. Uh, oh, really? I hope. We'll, we'll, we'll see. Oh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Um, <laughs> All right, we'll yeah, let the cat out we'll of the see. bag, but I think but, I would, uh, I'll head down to Houston if you're, um, definitely if you're there at it, especially if, if he has you do the, I think the debate is something he wants to do as like a, um, a tradition. So that yeah. would be super fun if, um, and it's interesting, notice what people, how you and I are relating to one another, even though we disagree about these profoundly important issues. At the end of the day, that's what I like about real a theology, you, Ben, um, and other YouTubers I'm coming across more now, I think they're just kind of tired, tired. of the new, the, the new atheist shtick. It's like, yeah. no, let's, let's raise the dialogue and talk about, I have hope for, there's one person I have hope for, and that's Stephen Woodford from Rationality Rules. You've been doing some stuff with him, actually. You're doing some more he, Kalam he's, videos. He's 1,000% on there. Yeah, and we're actually working on our, our second Kalam video. It's, it's going to be so epic. We're like drawing on so much research. We're drawing on the best stuff, like papers published in 2021, forthcoming papers, and, and so on. And so. It's, it's just so different from like his earlier work. Yeah, And I think is. he recognizes that, and he's he does. excited to kind of grow in that area. Yeah, he does. He he's noticed the same thing. He's told me that, because, you know, he and I are, you know, friends now, and so um, he's told me that. He's like, the, you know, he, he sees the increase in quality and he's, he's now, before he's doing videos, he's starting to like, like read papers and so on. He's asking me for like recommendations about, you know, certain like philosophical videos and topics and papers before he makes videos on them. So there's definitely improvement there. So, um, and that's, yeah. that's what we should see. And I feel the same way. I get super excited when I see uh, Christians who want to read the Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology and also read um, atheists, uh, read Graham Offie, read Mackey. And, um, yeah, not get, like Dawkins or something. <laughs> right, yeah. And now I will say this, though. There is, there is a place for Christians to respond to Dawkins, just like yeah. there is a place for atheists to respond to Ken Ham. Yeah. Because it is just... That is the perennial problem. For each of us will have an understanding. Uh, both of us can equally sympathize with this problem. The most interesting objections we want, we want to address are the least interesting to our general audience. <laughs> yes, yes.
And so that's the balance. That's why exactly. I kind of, like when I do the rebuttal videos, yours was the more sophisticated one I had earned after doing a few on the Antichrist. Uh, that basically <laughs> that's like, funny. it's just, it's just like, I have to, um, and I'm, ex and I'm excited to go through your, your reply to that. And then we'll, we'll you know, we can have more, not necessarily on YouTube, but we might have it in another forum more back and forth. And, mm -hmm. um, cause I'm hoping, I am hoping in the future to do a, it's called, I, a previous, uh, I did a book, The Case for Catholicism with Ignatius Press, and the president of it, Mark Brumley, described the book I wrote for him as middle brow. It's something between academic and popular. So he called it middle brow. Uh, I would like to write something like that for Christian theism, because I think it's actually kind of quite lacking. Like you have, generic apologetic book and then you have something from blackwell oxford baker academic or if you want to be real fancy pants it's funny when you write enough papers you probably get this way you have all the presses memorized like when you're citing things and and then you know like oh it's gruyerte press uh, it's a german probably I have, <laughs> yeah, to, exactly. I have to spend 150 bucks to get it or yeah you know, or hope that the author put it for free on his own web page somewhere the only book that you're describing that i think falls under middle brow that i'm aware of is how reason can lead to Josh's God by Josh book, yes. Yeah, that, I think that's the only one really that I know of. So it's yes, and, sitting right behind me. <laughs> and that's the, that's the gap that I've seen. Because I would also put like Swinburne's existence of God. It's academic or at least one rung below. It's, an, it's not a monograph, but it's academic. Yeah. Um, so that's why. And I think what's really neat to see with you and where, where Woodford is going and really theology is this level, this level here, which I would call middle brow, which is like, look, we're, we're aware of what philosophers are publishing. These are not academic monographs, but a, a lay person who applies themselves can read this. That would be the goal, I guess. Yeah. Sometimes uh, people have told me that <laughs> I go too highbrow, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, uh, middle brow is definitely the best because it, it tries to reach as, as many people as you can. And I try to simplify things, but some of them it's, uh, it's really difficult, uh, <laughs> but yeah. I, I try. <laughs> but, and that's what we have to, um, we have to do. And so that's what I'm, um, I'm excited to see. So in any case, we went longer than I expected, but this is super fun. So I'm okay with that. And it's my podcast. I can go as long as I want. Man. <laughs> Uh, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners where they can learn more about the, the work you're doing? Anything I might have left out or forgot? Go right ahead. No, I mean, yeah, like, um, I guess people can check out, like, like you said, uh, YouTube channel, Majesty of Reason. I've got a lot of fun stuff on there, conversations with philosophers like Josh Rasmussen, Rob Coons, Trent Merricks, and others. Um, most of my, or I also have lots of different lecture videos on arguments for and against God's existence. Um, a lot of really fun philosophy religion stuff. It's fun by my lights. Uh, extremely fun. And then um, on the scholarly level, they can check out my papers and as well as my, uh, well, my book, which is, let's see if I can point. Oh, yes. The Misty of Reason, A Short Guide to Critical Thinking and Philosophy. They can check that out on Amazon. But there's one central place where I finally got a new website. Um, just josephschmid.com, <laughs> S-C-H-M-I-D. So uh, it has all my papers on there. Free access. You can read my papers and, um, that I published and as well as link to my book and other sorts of things. Very good. Well, I'm super impressed. This is actually re really a lot of fun and I'm excited for people to listen to it. I'll leave you, by the way, with one last parting um, thought because I didn't bring this up beginning and I didn't want to because uh, some people can be sick of hearing it. A lot of people will comment on your age. You're an undergrad at Purdue, but you know a lot about philosophy and have really engaged people well on the subject. Um, and I, although the thing is people used, used to say that to be like, you're so young. And at first it'd be flattering. Other times it get kind of annoying. It's like, look, my age shouldn't have anything to do with the arguments that I'm presenting. And I might say that, look, I can understand being annoyed if people make a big deal about your age. I, I was annoyed, but, but here's the thing. One day they will stop and they won't say you look so young and they'll start saying, wow, you look really tired. And so you'll, you'll pine <laughs> for the days when people said you looked young and says saying you look really tired. Um, so, so, so if it annoys you now, if people get go on about your age, which I don't think they should, that doesn't affect your arguments. Um, just remember one day it'll pass and you'll, you'll miss it. Just, just putting it out there. So very true. And all the back problems and knee problems and, <laughs> Oh yeah, totally. So, all right, Joe, Joe Schmid, majesty of reason available at Joseph schmidt.com his professional philosopher website not joe schmidt it's joseph schmidt yes exactly my publishing name <laughs> yes you have to be uh you know what's funny actually so my colleague jimmy aiken he used to go by james aiken in his um uh articles and his books mm -hmm. and then when he got older 
uh, he didn't feel like he needed to really go by that. So he switched back. So maybe when you're 40 or 50, you might go back to Joe Schmidt for your publishing. You <laughs> we'll might, you, you might end up doing that. You never know. Joey, Joey, Joe Bob, who knows? I don't know. Some <laughs> people who are Joe, they hate being called like Joey or, or things like that. So cool uh, beans, Joseph Schmidt.com majesty of reason, uh, on YouTube, check them out. And then, um, hopefully you and I will be able to engage a few other topics, uh, in the future, but thanks for being on the podcast today. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thank you guys for listening, and I hope that you all have a very blessed day. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you want to help us produce more great content like this, be sure to click subscribe and go to trenthornpodcast.com to become a premium subscriber. You'll help us create more videos like this and get access to bonus content and sneak peeks of our upcoming projects.